I really do feel inside I'm still inventing or thinking and outside there's a puppet and it's called Maxine Green <laughs> and I have a great feeling of a separation from that puppet. <laughs> Very, I think other people must feel that way. When you tell a story about your life, it's not the way you lived it. <laughs> so, you know, once you give it a shape, it's not the way it was. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, because your life was only one damn thing after the other. I was born in Brooklyn from uh, very, uh, with, a, with a father who came from a German background. He was, they were both born here, but he was, and he wasn't educated. She went through high school, uh, but uh, he, he, he carried the German um, snobbery, even though he didn't really earn it. And my mother, as far as he was concerned, came from the lowest level of, of Jews, because she was un Hungarian. The terrible prejudices, you know, within groups. There were four of us, and uh, I was the oldest, and then there were twins, a girl and a boy, and then my youngest sister, uh, who, who I always thought was my child. And she, of, of the four of us, she also became an academic, but a social worker. My father sent us, to, sent us all, and then he never had enough money to send the others to an Episcopalian school, so I would assimilate. And uh, when, when it was time to graduate, the principal said, it's such a shame you're Jewish. She said, I could get you a scholarship to Mount Holyoke. And I remember I apologized, and I'm so ashamed that I apologized. But anyway, I went to Barnard because the, there was a quota system, because it was larger. And, uh, but, and then the other thing was, I was supposed to be the valedictorian, but, but they decided to have the uh, graduation in a Methodist church, so I couldn't be the, you know, those, they're not terrible things, but uh, I think it did give me a kind of uh, being an outsider. When I think back now, it was so, uh, I don't know, so uh, arbitrary and so formal and so, and no, nothing like we do now. I mean, nothing like you know, involving the student in, in, in the learning process. And then uh, at, in three and a half years, <clears throat> I thought, oh, I had enough of this and I had enough points. I used to get honor points. So I, I eloped. <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to get away from home and the best way to do that was to elope. <laughs> So we, I, was go, I was very sort of radical then. I think I was 19, so I couldn't have a regular marriage. So we, we stopped at a roadside rabbi, like, you know, and he married us. And then when I got home, I remember my father, who was my main love in life and my own, my authority, you know, he's standing at the window and when he got angry, he had a muscle and it went like this. <laughs> so he turns around and he says, I still can't make sense of it. He says, the way of the pioneer is hard. I was <laughs> is nonsense, you know. Uh, I was ashamed to be, to know anything he didn't know. You know, so I, I and he was sort of scornful about college and university people and experts. And they didn't encourage me to go to college at all. And I was thinking in many ways, I, I, not only did I always feel like an imposter, you know, but I always felt like a liar, that I was like a traitor to what my mother and father were, were making, what especially my mother made me into. It was just, and uh, so I was very ambivalent. You know, I wanted, I probably still was in the college. I, I wanted to be a good girl. 
but I wanted to be something at the same time, and being something was at the opposite of being a good girl. I guess that's not unusual, you know, but so I was always, even in the college, uh, when I, when I saw what was happening to women in the college, I was still going to Larry Kremen when he was more in our department, say, you need coffee. You know, I go down to get coffee. I was such a nice girl, you know. And on the other hand, I was writing those things and during the Vietnam War, another guy and I were the only people who really carried on about it. And I was the only one who used to go to Washington with the students, you know. So I would do that, but I was nice little, like I used to say, uh, I had to stop myself from curtsying when I saw the president come down the hall. The people who think of themselves as radical, I think they don't think I'm radical en enough. <laughs>
to do some. So I don't know how to solve that. I'm trying to. I keep trying to talk about the difference between schooling and education. Education helps individuals grow and become, and schooling makes them proper servants of the technocratic society. For education is the basis of genuine production of wealth and is the foundation of good business. That's what scares me, really. I hate to think of history as repeating itself. But uh, there was the 60s. I think that's the only way that the United States is going to maintain its freedom. Let's have a dream. Lift off on Apollo 11. Mass card burning was urged. There was the 60s with that interest in uh, free schools and the romantic approach to children. It wasn't everybody, but it was there. You remember Paul Goodman and you know, people who really talked in Emersonian terms about growth and stuff. But then a lot of people think it was that that caused the 70s. You know, people were so frightened by that kind of... But then there was the competencies thing, you know, and... and uh, we were so uh, inferior to European countries. And then we had D uh, Diane and we had Checker Finn and all these people writing what is worth knowing. And remember Hirsch, what every American adult should know. And education gets boiled down to a few prescriptions. It, it is so, and now we're at the bottom of that movement. I mean, this is all Bush kind of philosophy. It's, it's so hard to change. No child left behind. The language of no child left behind and, uh, uh, you know, achievement gap and accountability and assessment, they're all like screens so you won't see what's really wrong. Education is to a state what national defense is to the federal government. What you do is you teach so that the accountability system you know, when you do test, a child can, is proficient, be competitive. So be competitive in the future, highly competitive, are going to be competitive. Enhance the competitiveness. What we will not do is to allow people to get rid of accountability systems. I don't think we were ever as affected by the federal government as we are now. I'm very, I'm almost paranoid about some of the discussion that goes on when accountability is discussed, when minimum competencies are discussed. But I want people to be angry. I keep redefining myself. It's, it, you know, it's hard to know. I, uh, I think I'm a teacher, I don't know, I think I'm a writer first and then a teacher. Uh, and I think my teaching feeds into my writing and my writing into my teaching. How did I change and am I false to myself? I want to uh, rewrite, if I have time and can live long enough, I would love to uh, rewrite a little bit of Teacher is Stranger. It, and I, when I read it over, at first I thought, it's so 60s, I can't. But when I read it over, I thought, I would like to say a lot of these things now.
I gather people like the release of imagination. Maybe because it's the last one, and I'm always very aware of incompleteness. And when I get to the last one, I have even more feeling of incompleteness, and that's the dialectic of freedom. And I start to write, and it really does come. It really, and I don't know how or why, or even if it's any good, but but it's part of it is like trust yourself, and it, it's like flow. <laughs> There is something about it, and I don't understand it. And uh, I think I'm terribly lucky because I gather that a lot of stuff I didn't even know was accumulating is accumulating. And part of it is memory. Part of it may be a creativity. Part of it is, uh, I suppose, being affected by the prose of things that I read and feeling so strongly that there should be a concreteness. I wrote a book called The Public School and the Private Vision, and I, I was interested in the relationship between American literature and American educational thought. So many of the people who preceded all these movements about critical theory were American, and they're left out of that history, like Frederick Douglass, you know, for one thing, or Thoreau, or Emerson, or some of the people around them in a kind of reform movement, and the, the women reformers, the early suffragites, who said some amazing things, who understood about power, and, and so it's partly history that, that uh, you know, I go into, and partly always the literary genre. Words, English words, are full of echoes, memories, associations. They've been out and about on people's lips, in their houses, in the streets, in the fields, for so many centuries. And that is one of the chief difficulties in writing in today. They're stored with other meanings, with other memories. And they've contracted so many famous marriages in the past. Words belong to each other. How can we combine the old words in new order so that they survive and so that they create beauty, so that they tell the truth? That is the question. I've gone through many shades, you know. I think uh, I think I started with Kierkegaard, not the Lutheran side of Kierkegaard, but uh, you know the whole business of creating yourself, and and it seems so important to me that Kierkegaard really discovered the public and had you know and the crowd and how you had, and then uh, you know I had. Uh, you know, you always feel you have a little dance with Nietzsche. <laughs> and uh, and then, uh, you know, I was really taken with Sartre. For, and then, uh, I, because of Sartre's uh, sort of ambivalence toward social connections, even despite the... Uh, Merleau-Ponty was the one. Merleau-Ponty was the most important one for me. I was you know, try to tell students about how it all begins somehow in a primordial uh, uh, world, a perceived world. And then how he talks later on is you can never return to it, but you try to reflect back on it. I think that's so important. Just I think uh, Sartre doesn't really talk about perception and Dewey does it, not in the same way.
that's from Sartre, I think. And he uh, he says, you know, that you you're very present in your absence, and like he gives an example he, that he, he's going to a cafe and he's supposed to meet Pierre at the cafe, and he goes to the cafe and Pierre isn't there, and it's like there's a hole in the cafe that all he can notice is the absence of, of uh, and I, you know, I try to use that idea that uh, uh, to, to look at the absence of equity in our society, you know, is, is, is uh, to be aware of, of what it might be if there was equity. I think the first philosophic influence, if you would call it philosophic, was Camus, you know, and not just Myth of Sisyphus or the novels, but The Rebel. And my idea of rebellion came from that. Like a lot of people, I thought of uh, uh, modernism as a, a kind of rejection of formalism, and and a uh, uh, and I loved the so-called modernist writers like T.S. Eliot and uh, Joyce and so on. Now that I know something about postmodernism, I'm much more critical about it. For example. Uh, I, I, one of the criticisms of, of modernism, I think, or, was, uh, uh, or maybe it sort of got associated with the criticism of the Enlightenment and rationalism, and the idea that I read Adorno, for example, and uh, how they say that with all the applause for rationalism and so on, it, did, it still led to technocracy and the building of the concentration camps and Hiroshima. The projectile of the right size and velocity. And, and those are the kind of flowerings of that wonderful rationalism and technical thinking. And I'm, I'm much more aware of that than I was, you know. And then uh, the other thing I'm aware of was that the postmodernists talk about the meta narrative. Dinner time is happy time for this family. They talk about the good things that happen each day. The beginning of the old primer uh, about uh, the two kids who lived in a farm and they had a dog named Spot and a cat named so-and-so and, -so and the, the father would come home from work and, and, uh, it, it's, and Toni Morrison said, that's the meta-narrative that we impose on children. And she's saying it controls the baby books that children use. And it's why the child in the bluest eye wants to grow up and have blue eyes and, 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 and blonde hair. I think a lot of people think read novels to sort of prettify or to make things, you know, more, uh, I don't know, easier, but they're not, they go level by level. I never think of myself as a researcher, you know. I think of myself as a, a philosopher and a humanities person. And uh, I suppose, even unconsciously, when I I refer to so many novels in my writing and so much poetry in my writing. I don't think it's research. You know, probably for you, it's research in the qualitative sense or Gautama's sense that research is to find the meaning of what you're looking at. It's, it's not to measure it. So I think, uh, you know, I, I think I do it that way. Because I think the researcher, as many people understand it, is explain something, and I'm not. I'm not so interested in explaining. I'm ex interested in showing the meaning, but I can't prove it. Does that bother you, qualitative people?
How do you know when someone else has an aesthetic experience? Or how do you know when you have one and how do you explain it? If I know more about perception and I know more about imagination, I can talk more meaningfully about what happens in an encounter between a person and a work of art. And I was just say, just writing, uh, but I can't prove that either, that for me, like for a lot of people, the, the, uh, the perceiver or the appreciator is on one side and the work of art is at the other. And the work of art is an event that occurs in the encounter between consciousness and the work. I don't want to say it's measurable, but I think that's true. I think you have to think of it as an event, and it's never the same for different people. Well, I, first of all, you know, I try very hard to read the various positions in aesthetics, and I often uh, begin a lecture or a class and uh, uh, asking myself about uh, transcendent ideas or Aristotelian ideas of my mimesis or expressionist approaches or formalist approaches and presently particip participant approaches. And then I always ask and I ask myself, why does a tough secular person like me when she hears something like some Bach cantatas or reads King Lear, I, I really feel I'm in touch with something transcendental, uh, you know. And why is that? And how does that happen? Is, is it a traditional linkage of the spirit? But it doesn't seem to be fed into me. It's a, so those are, that's a kind, and I ask people and, and myself, which of those approaches is most convincing? I think all of them at, at, diff at, different, at different points. If you aren't capable of, ha of being able to appreciate art, you're blind to half of what uh, the world offers you. Like, like for example, those trees, uh, they're not made by an artist, but I have an aesthetic experience with them. And I don't know if it's because I saw Manet or not. I think there's a way of being in the world that, that uh, you know, can be called aesthetic. It's consciousness in the world. There's no separation. And if I can look at those trees, not just as a spectator, you know, by, but, but it's my blood supply, you know. And I think if people, so many people uh, are, uh, deprived of that because we don't have arts. Or very few people say, when the kids come to school, did you notice the leaf after the rain stopped? And I think it's a terrible deprivation. But the trouble is if the teacher doesn't feel it, it's gonna be phony, that's the trouble, you know. One of the biggest challenges comes from art education. We don't do, you know, my, our idea is, or my idea is that to give a, ch a child a chance to work with medium and stuff should bring him closer to uh, appreciating art. But to do it just for creativity's sake, or, you know, it gets lost after they get beyond that. I first met Maxine in the, um, from a distance. I was in the audience as a teaching artist at Lincoln Center Institute. Seeing her um, speak was um, slowly, it took me a couple of years to realize what she was really saying, but it just started to, to just fill my life with, um, with uh, new meaning about what I was doing as a teaching artist. So having a conversation with Maxine um, may, was an opportunity to feel 
like you were so special, you know, that, that, that there are people in the world who can make you feel like you are the only person in the world that matters at the moment that you are talking to them. And Maxine was absolutely one of those people. Um, she would, would see you. She always had this way of, uh, of recognizing you. Maxine did. She always had a sort of, um, as if she was always delighted to see you. I remember one of the most moving pieces of, of writing that I've read of, of Maxine's work was in Releasing the Imagination, where she talks about um, a student, a, a middle school student, and saying that opera was boring or something like that. And she said, um, you know, at first her reaction was, well, you know, this student doesn't know anything and, you know, this kind of self-satisfied, high culture response. And then she said, well, what do I know about the music that he loves? And that just embodied to me who Maxine was. Having a conversation with Maxine was always an adventure because um, it sort of had something to do with either the book that we were reading together or the latest um, Dancing with the Stars that she had seen that she wanted to talk about. It never seemed like she was trying to be profound, but it's, it was always profound, even if it was funny and fun and playful and gossipy. Uh, you could tell um, her mind was working on lots of levels. She also was very unpretentious in herself. There were so many times that she had given a talk and she would turn to me or somebody else and say, do you think they liked it? As if it was the first time she had given a talk. She, I don't, she was just eminently human and yet um, astonishingly insightful. Maxine at Home. This is a story of Maxine, my mother-in-law, and her memories of this particular apartment. Maxine gazed outside her window, viewing solid trees releasing their leaves, dancing down, then crowded by careless runners, robust in good health. Beginners or certain runners would race on. She remained locked in her wheelchair, missing walking and touring the world. A proud New Yorker, well-traveled to all places, with a stillborn dream to ride the tourist bus, to sit on its double-decker top, wave on, regal, royal, seeing a world of contradictions.